Welcome to the Climate Buzz podcast. The Climate Buzz is co-hosted by Dr. Bob Hanna, Kelly Sheehan, and Brad Rouse. Each week we share with you the stories, the people, the science, the challenges and solutions of a warming planet. We invite you to like and follow our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube pages where we promise to keep you up on the latest climate buzz and share the links, information, and footage discussed on the show. The Climate Buzz originally aired live on Asheville FM, a nonprofit, volunteer powered community radio station based in Asheville, North Carolina. Asheville FM is dedicated to producing diverse and eclectic programming that inspires our listeners to build connections across our communities and to discover new music and ideas. The Climate Buzz airs live on Mondays, 9 to 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and can be heard locally on 103.3 FM and streamed and archived at www.ashevillefm.org. Today's show aired live on June 12, 2023 on Asheville FM with Bob Hanna and Brad Rouse and guest Anna Alsobrook, who is the French Broad Watershed Science and Policy Manager with Mountain True, a nonprofit organization that champions resilient forests, clean waters, and healthy communities in the Southern Blue Ridge Mountains. Enjoy. Welcome to the Climate Buzz. I'm Bob Hanna. And I'm Brad Rouse. And we're committed to sharing with you the people, the stories, the science, the challenges, and the solutions of a warming planet. It's June 12, 2023, and the current level of global carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is 424.10. The Climate Buzz wants you to know that all opinions and words shared on the show are those of the people who speak them and not the station or underwriters of the station. I had the Climate Buzz theme song all ready to go, but then I kind of wanted to tune in to, to the show we had in September when our guest today, Anna also Brooke, was uh, has on, joined yeah. us. Yeah, she's fun. Uh, yeah, she's Mountain True's French Broad watershed science and policy manager where she facilitates water quality monitoring citizen science and improvement programs in the french broad river watershed and we're going to be talking about this in the second half of the show is mountain true just released their state of our rivers report that combines a year's worth of data collected by its staff and volunteers with other publicly available data sets to provide readers with a deeper understanding of the health of our rivers lakes and streams and anna Welcome, Welcome to the Climb of Us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. I'm glad yeah. to be here. We are, too. Great. I'm really looking forward to, to, to learning more about, um, I know we talked about it in September, but um, the report is out. So, uh, and, and not only, you know, that the, the report kind of is telling us what's going on in our streams, but they have a much, right, Anamite, they have a much clearer idea kind of what needs to be done, clean up um, some of our rough spots. Exactly. So. Yeah. We, we put in some good policy solutions to help tackle um, some of the issues that we're seeing. So I'm glad to dig into that today. Yeah. yeah, I thought about all that. I was down by the river this weekend, and uh, there are a lot of people out there floating. And my wife was like, "Well, I'm not sure I want to do that based on what I hear about the river." So let's we'll get into that later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I um, it, it's true actually. So um, <laughs> the the part that runs through through Asheville um has a lot of challenges. Boy, right there now. are a lot of so. people on it. Maybe that's part of the challenge. But there was a lot of people out there. But there's a lot we can do. So I know. There you Ho- go. Hopeful story. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. Well, you know, I was thinking, you know, I was watching my my Facebook thread and seeing a lot of kids and families I know graduating um, over this week. And Asheville High School had its graduation for the class of 2023, the Asheville High School wow. Stadium. Uh, my son is 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 just um, one year away from his own graduation. So we're, we're seeing uh, kind of a, you You're know, we're just... being an empty nester oh here, goodness, Bob. I know. I don't, not long. I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. So... Uh, <laughs> You have to start a new radio show. <laughs> and so um, I, I share the graduations because a, a very famous climate activist also graduated over the weekend, and it's Greta Thunberg, took part in her last school strike for climate. I believe it was her 151st strike of some sort. And if, you, if, if you've been living in a hole and, and you're not aware... Um, Greta Thunberg, um, back in 2018, was um, decided that she wasn't going to go to school 
on Friday. She was going to, you know, she, in that she was going to um, um, do a climate protest. Um, kind of caught stuff. on. Friday's for the future, right? It was. And, and you know, over um, in 2019, millions of youth striked from school for the climate, flooding the streets in over 180 countries. And then um, when the pandemic started, they, they started to find new ways um, to protest. And um, she, she's not wrapping it up for good, of course. And, and she's still going to be out there doing her work. But she said, since I don't go to school anymore, I can't do any more school strikes. And um, so she's in the news for that. And um, you just wonder when she applies to college, uh, mm-hmm. uh, if she puts in her application, we'll be striking every Friday. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, you know, Greta Thunberg, I, I just thought, I you really know, have a, just a lot remark- of respect for her. I know. Absolutely. And of course, if, if, if you know Greta, she's, she, she's been given the diagnosis. She's on the spectrum of autism. And um, so she has this uncanny, uncanny ability to, to speak, um, to kind of just to the point and um, really just keep it, you know, focused on the idea of, you know, we need to lower greenhouse gas emissions and we're not doing enough. And so when she goes to all these conferences and all the big politicians and, and policymakers are trying to spin this um, in one way or the other, um, you know, I love how she just keeps it right on point that needs to be done and um, been a real inspiration for many youth all over the world. So um, Greta Thunberg graduated from school. So other thing that we... Big milestone. Yeah. And Anna, you were talking, and we were talking before the show a little bit about also um, noticing climate in the air this past weekend. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty hazy out there for most of us, and I think it's pretty wild. We're we're seeing that from wildfires that are happening in Canada. I don't know if folks got out this weekend, but it's hard to see well, those if mountains. You, <laughs> yeah. If you're on social media and you see those pictures from New England New, or New York and the Middle Atlantic states, they yeah they really had it bad. New York and Philadelphia completely. Well, they shut down LaGuardia Airport for a while. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, so it does. It's it starts to have economic effects and from something so far away. And, and of course, what I really like is that the media uh, is really, at least the media that I watch, um, is really talking about the connection to climate change mm-hmm. as being one of the factors that um, contributing to the, these wildfires that, that the smoke situation is the worst that anybody's ever encountered yeah. in the East Coast. I mean, uh, uh, off the charts, it's not a regular thing. It's something new. You know, of course, the West had it for years. They are getting a little bit of a break now but uh, uh, it just shows up and you know in Canada they let these forests burn yeah um, because it's so vast up there there's so much carbon stored that um, you know these of course these wildfires you know release a lot of carbon into the atmosphere too uh, which is not helpful 421 fires were burning as of Friday um, and that the number of fires deemed out of control um, was 230 and and it had been high Higher, but there was some rain um, that hit the area of Quebec that, that kind of helped bring it down. Over 43,000 square kilometers have burned so far this year, making 2023 the second worst year for fires on record. A milestone from 2014 probably eclipsed this weekend. Right. And it's interesting. And, I was, that's, and that's so far this year. So we've got know, another we've, half the year to go. I right? know. Exactly. So that's and we're amazing. already there. And interestingly, you know, um, you know, Canada is kind of having the same conversations that we're having here in, in the U.S. about, you know, saying that enough is not being done. And um, despite knowing what we need to do, it's not happening. And um, it said um, it's prompted fierce debate in the House of Commons with Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party accusing the rival conservatives of fighting carbon taxes and not providing serious serious policy amid a changing climate. While at the same time, the new Democratic Party accused Trudeau's government of failing on climate action, citing subsidies for fossil fuel companies and the approval for controversial resource extraction projects. Scientists have been warning us about this for years. Everybody should be working on reducing fossil fuel emissions. That's the critical thing. These fires are telling us something. We really need to take action right now. We need to get serious about reducing fossil fuel emissions. 
Here, so here. That is the conversation happening right yeah, now it, in it, Canada as they face it, these wildfires. And, and it's happening here. I mean, it was happening here. And we, we had our meeting last week in Buncombe County for the strategic plan for getting to 100% renewable. And um, it, it, it's just pretty clear we've got to bring those fossil fuel emissions. We don't need to simply reduce them. I mean, I think a lot of people really haven't got – people are – the media is getting the message out there that – um, there is um, a, a climate problem, and we need to do things to get ready for it. I don't think the media has really turned the corner yet, though, on saying people and saying to people. And the implication is, we have got to bring fossil fuel use to zero, mm-hmm. or you know, as close as we can possibly get, and somehow counterbalance the rest because we need our net emissions to be to be zero. And the implications of right. that are 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 pretty profound in terms of yeah. the way we organize our lives. Now we have oh we have a few years to do it. We have 20, 30 years to do it. Well, but, that's all. <laughs> but uh, but but that means we need to make a huge amount of progress right away. Yeah. Um, and and the implications of it. Um, and if, if I, I could kind of bleeds into my story, if you want me to talk talk about that, um, please. Um, which is the implication of it. It is so much in so many different sectors of of the economy, but one of them is transportation. And, you know, really the implication of it is that somewhere out in the not too distant future, we need to have transportation not be powered by fossil fuels, which means probably um, uh, electric transportation um, for all transport. And people are starting to recognize that that's happening um, things are changing in a, in a, in a positive way. Uh, and, and I wanted to bring up a couple of news stories just to highlight that the big one in my mind, being an electric car owner is that, um, and I, I, I count this as real progress that over the last couple of weeks, both Ford and general motors have announced that they will be adopting at least, um, as a second option, as another option on their vehicles, the Tesla standard for charging. I saw that article. Um, And I think that is a tremendously positive move. I also saw that some of the non-Tesla charging stations out there, including EVgo, will be offering Tesla charging on their non-Tesla stations. So that Basically, I can see that we're moving towards it's sort of the Betamax versus VHS debate. Or so there's or two the, types of charging there, well, stations there's, now, there's, depending uh, on what car uh, you uh, have. Is that what I understand? There, there, there's a there's kind of a, a basic uh, kind of charging that Tesla, you know, for the very slow charging, like for charging from your home on a regular outlet. There, basically, there's a pretty easy way for all makes and models of vehicles to be accommodated. The problem, the issue comes from your highway fast charging. When you need a, a fast charge, uh-huh. more like a gas station. And there's basically been two standards that have evolved. One called CCS. Um, don't ask me what that stands for. But uh, a lot of different number of organizations adopted that. And the second is Tesla. Which um, is and that's called NACS, um, which is Tesla's name for it, um, and basically only Tesla adopted that. But the thing is, Tesla's got seventy five percent of the electric vehicles out there, and it has two thirds of the charging stations out there. So even though only one company adopted the standard, the Tesla standard, it's got way more than anybody than everybody else combined. Yeah, um, and. What's happening now, but the plans of all these other vehicles are to be competitive with Tesla. So, uh, you know, what's going to happen now is that Ford and General Motors have decided that all new Ford cars and all new General Motor electric cars by 2025 will have the option of being charged with a Tesla charger and will have access to the Tesla charging system. So that with one simple agreement and a few billion dollars paid to Tesla to make this all happen yeah. uh, to accommodate their costs of it. Um, they they will have access to the world's lar- uh, to America's largest charging network by far. Wow! Um, with, and I I don't know if you've ever seen the chargers, but it's like I don't even know. It's like comparing a fire hose to a garden hose in terms of the ability to handle uh-huh. it. The but the garden hose actually has more power 
which is the Tesla, because it's small and sleek and, and not heavy, has more power and can push more juice than the big, clunky old CCS chargers. They're just a lot easier. I mean, not that you can't, ha- you can handle the CCS charger, but it's just bulky. It's not yeah. elegant. It's a bad design. Okay. It's a design. I've, been, I've heard it said it's a design by committee. Mm-hmm. So, um, so anyway, that's big news uh, in on the electric vehicle front. Well, did you mind. hear too? I, and I I posted it on our kind of on our on our text thread that In- Ingalls is had just just a story just came out that Ingalls is committed to putting charging stations at the grocery stores, and um, which is going to you know there's a lot of Ingalls um, here in the region, and um, their plan right. is to start. Um, creating charging stations. Well, the one up on Merriman already has charging uh, up there um, and has charging, but that's slow charging. Now, I wonder what this new, what Ingalls is going to be doing with this. I I, I also saw a design for a new Ingalls where they had had charging in. Wow, that's um, amazing. Yeah, and and really we need, the big problem with charging (laughs) is, I think, with this Tesla 4 GM mode, Going on long trips is not going to be a problem. The big problem now with, and you know, Tesla's going to roll it out. It's a revenue center. They're going to be able to make money on it. They're going to be able to justify doing it. Yeah. And then eventually vendors, gas stations, everybody else is going to want charging near their location because that brings customers in because you wait 10, uh-huh. 15, 20 minutes. People go in and buy a cup of coffee. They buy, you right. know, and your gas stations, they make their money on, they don't make their money on the gas pumps. They make their money on, the yeah, if you look store. at what it costs to put a gas pump in, bury that big tank in the ground, <laughs> deal with the pollution abatement from removing it when it finally has to be done. It's, it's way cheaper to put an electric charger. And so people, you know, these vendors are going to want it because it brings traffic in. Mm-hmm. But the big problem is people who can't charge at home which is your apartments, your some of your condos, your people who are renters that, that our landlord doesn't want to put charging in and doesn't want to put an outdoor out. Right. I mean, really, all you need for overnight charging, in my mind, is just a regular outlet, even with an extension cord, but it needs to be a dedicated circuit. It's probably better to be able to charge it faster than that. So, you know, you might need like a dryer connection. Mm-hmm. Um, in your home. And the and the big problem is apartment complexes. What are those people going to do? Right. Um, and and that's because they, they would have to basically drive to a charging station in their right. city and, 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 and kind of wait there. And, and look, when you go to a charging station, you pay a couple of times more than if you charge at home. Yeah. So it's it's more expensive. But but it's really cheap, right? I mean, in, well, in, in, I you in, know in it, comparison it, it, to, um, no, to to what gasoline I, costs. I, I I don't think it's much cheaper when you get to the superchargers. Okay, it's pretty similar when you're on your road trips. So, so I don't know. It, you know, it's not a gallon, obviously, but um, the cost per <laughs> mile per mile is what is, it is. a little bit less. It's a lot less if you're charging at home. Mm-hmm. And you don't pay the premium to be able to charge somewhere else. It's a lot less. Mm-hmm. But, um, and that's where most people with homes are going to charge most of the time. Most of your miles are going to be at home. But when you're yeah. taking that road trip, just you're going to pay a little bit more. Well, until we get comp- competition among the among the providers i mean right and i'm and yeah. i'm speak i'm speaking about tesla what they charge i don't know what the other people charge so maybe you know you know but in, now that everybody's going to have the same standard or like we're looking like there's going to be the same standard then it could be more competition just like we have with gas stations mm-hmm. um but uh, so there's a lot of potential for those electric chargers to get a lot less okay on those road trips but it's better to be able to charge at home or at your workplace or at, i mean some places you can charge for free i mean you know if you go to the parking deck and pay your parking here in Asheville, you charge. For, there's a couple of most of the city parking decks have a couple of charging stations there, and you and the and so the city is is you, that. Yeah, you pay for free. You, yeah. you have to pay to park, and that's that. Ah. You know, but uh, and you don't get enough juice to actually make parking free. Mm-hmm. Um, you you still end up paying. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and how and say you go. I've seen them at Whole Foods parking lots and the Civic Center. How how does that work? Do you pay there too? Well, it depends. Okay. A lot of times when you're you're getting a slow charger at a lot of those places, and usually those are free. Mm-hmm. Typically, those are free. You you know if you, you know, Southern Alliance for Clean Energy down here on Orchard Street, right right off of downtown, has I think four chargers, and if you if you 
um, make a minimal donation to Southern Alliance for Clean Energy for the year as a, a charitable donation, um, then you can charge for free. You put a little sticker on your car and you can charge for free there. Ooh, that's nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the thing about it is, you kind of need to park all day to really have it be. And I think that they may have a, some of these places have a four hour limit or a two hour limit on how long you can hog up the charger, basically. Um, although I don't know if they enforce it, but they, they do. There's, there's sort of a growing body of charging etiquette out there. I bet. And there's going to be more and more of that. You know, it would be interesting if maybe the city or county, as we build these apartment complexes, kind of kind of model that into the development plans, you know, X amount of parking spaces geared for EV. I, you know, to me, that is, that is um, a beginnings of a battle, and I don't, I think, you know, the Blue Horizons Project Trans- Transportation Committee in in our strategic plan for that effort is proposing some new – I don't think we can impose a standard, so it's have to be in line with the incentives. And it maybe they already include that as an incentive in where the city has to get in and improve a development. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it really it should be standard that um, – especially with underground parking, I mean, where you have an assigned – place like in a condo or something there should be yeah it, every one of those every one of those places ought to be at least ev ready you know when they build a new one even if even if the person who wants to park there has to pay a little extra to get it set up it should be ready so that you can so you just you know there's a there's a line there is the so much cheaper yeah. the infrastructure infrastructure is there it's just a matter of it being ev yeah. ready yeah because it's coming well and you um or else we're gonna fry yeah well with that said Literally. Asheville Citizen Times just reported a story that was first published by um, USA Today, where Asheville ranked number three um, as far as cities of the top 12 cities that are most likely to receive an influx of residents due to climate migration. And it kind of came out of an idea of sustainable real estate and that people now are beginning to be less certain about a 30-year fixed mortgage, which is often the standard one, about taking on a 30-year mortgage um, if they're in an area that is particularly vulnerable to climate change. And, um, you know, and that's with rising sea levels and more destructive storms and, and warmer temperatures that people are fleeing um, coastal areas um, and looking for new places to live. And um, interestingly, um, Asheville made the list. And it, it seems that we're already growing pretty rapidly um, since 2010. Where we had about 83,000 people, we saw a 13% increase in our population at 2020, which is part of the U.S. Census, where now we have about 94,000 people in this area. And that there's a lot of things that, you know, not only they call it, they call it push and pull factors. The push factors are what push people out of a community to say, I don't want to live here anymore. There's too much risk involved to pull factors um, that, you know, th- that a city would have um, kind of the economic viability. We have the culture here in Asheville. You know, we have Mission Hospital uh, and, and good health system here um, that are going to bring people here to town. And I thought I'd just kind of give you um, the top city list of the 12 climate resilient cities. So we'll, we'll start from number 12, Green Bay, Wisconsin, Toledo, Ohio. Then Buffalo, New York, Syracuse, New York, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Here's another one close to home. Johnson City, Tennessee makes, I think, the number three, seventh. Lynchburg, Virginia at six. Charlottesville, Virginia at five. Knoxville, Tennessee at four. And then there's Asheville at three. Um, Number two, surprisingly, Orlando, Florida which I think they they believe all the Florida migration from the coast is going to move in to Orlando. I I just wonder what the, (laughs) you know, Orlando for a while until the sea level rise gets really bad. Yeah, there's a (laughs) lot of water in Orlando, too. But, you know, and then the top one, Duluth, Minnesota. Right made the number one list, which I don't even know where to Most of them are north. I mean, most of the migration has been to the Sun Belt, and most of them are either Appalachian or, you know, even, well, like, I think Asheville, but Knoxville, Johnson City. I mean, these are a cool. Yeah, all right around this area. They're cooler, and Lynchburg. They are cooler places 
so you know the the because of the elevation we're all kind of up higher elevation and uh, maybe that's a factor uh, that people are looking at that not quite the heat of the deep south and um, certainly off the coast it makes a lot of sense to me but i i've actually heard people mention to me oh yeah I've climate you know climate is an issue of why i moved to Asheville. yeah so this is not you know well and it's part of it's because of the Asheville climate it's, it's really I mean, part I think of why we have more I, months of the year we can yeah. be outside it's certainly part of why I don't want to leave, thinking right. that this is a, right. a safe. I mean, I always right. before I saw this list, thinking right. that this is a safe haven right. in some ways. You know, just from the, just from the heat waves that just take right. place down, down. Right. You know, just down the mountain is unbelievable compared to. You know, we can go up on the parkway and get some cool air, and and you know, and, and just have a whole different you know level of comfort than most of the state of North Carolina has. So sure. Well, we need to take a short break here on the Climate Buzz. Uh, part of the climate migration is also going to be affecting our water quality. So we're excited to have Anna Alsobrook here um, from Mountain True. Um, and she's going to be talking. Um, we're going to be talking about the state of our rivers report that Mountain True just published. So stick around. We're excited today to reintroduce our guest, Anna Alsobrook, uh, to the Climate Buzz. She's Mountain True's French Broad Watershed Science and Policy Manager. She facilitates water quality monitoring, citizen science, and improvement programs in the French Broad River Watershed. And um, Anna, welcome back welcome to back. the Climate Buzz. Thank you all for having me. It's cool to be here. First time in the studio, right? You did a, you did a phone and back in September. Yeah, last so. time I think I was I was in Memphis, so y'all were able to telephone me in. It was pretty cool. Yeah, we, we got <laughs> all the technology. Here, yeah. So sometimes there's a glitch, but yeah. So how did you find your way to Mountain True, and and you know to, to become um kind of the you know the water the watershed science and policy manager? That's a really cool title, Anna. Thank you. Yeah, um, I it took. A, a long road to get here. Um, so I studied geography in school uh, and through classes got really interested in, in kind of like how water, we use water as a resource and how that looks differently in different parts of the world. I studied abroad in South Africa for a semester and was in a region um, the first time it rained there. I got really sick. And so that was my first real experience of how water quality impacts health of, you know, a of us. And then that kind of fed me into to my grad school work. Um, well, let me back up a little bit. That fed me, I guess, more into my, uh, I w- did Peace Corps after I graduated undergrad in, in rural Senegal, West Africa. And, and my village was in the middle of nowhere. We had one well uh, about half a mile away, I guess. Um, wow. And it was very deep. And so in order to get all the water for our needs, we had to, you know, have a bucket and put the bucket down the well and then attach the other end of the line to a horse or a donkey to pull that bucket up once it was full of water. And that's because it was over 70 meters down the water table was. And so that whole experience really got me acquainted with water as a scarcity now, and is that Senegal? Is that a like a des- desertifying pl- area? Is that is that? Yeah, yeah, it's wow. right. Yeah, exactly. Um, what an it, experience! It is very different over there, <laughs> to say the least. Um, very sparse vegetation. They have a very short rainy season, and maybe it, it might be six six weeks long, eight weeks long, maybe. And but everything just kind of pops green all of the sudden for those few weeks and then it all dies back down. Um so yeah, being in that environment you really learn to deal with a lot less of everything, <laughs> especially water and um Yeah. And yeah. I bet the community, right? It- understands how precious that water is and the way that they take care of it exactly yeah yeah everybody uses it in really efficient ways and oftentimes in that situation it meant using dirty water or using water in multiple ways so you you might be using water that's not quite as clean as it should be for things and and part of my job or my role there was to just kind of educate folks about what we can do to make better hygiene practices and 
a bunch of other kind of public health, environmental education type stuff. But all that is to say that experience led to my grad school, um, my desire to go to grad school to really focus on water and water resources. Um, and so I went back to school after Peace Corps and studied a project that was actually happening in Senegal, uh, where they're planting this wall of trees, essentially, to help aid in the desertification of that part of the region of the world. Um, they're making forests. They're making forests, reforestation. Uh, it's, you know, they're, the idea is to plant this belt of trees across that band of Africa to, you know, re or to improve that part of the environment. You know, there's to no, help to help the soil, help right? the soil, um, bring nutrients back to that part of the world, help infiltration of water when it does rain to re what is the word refill, you know, the water tables and things like that. So so it was a very interesting project. It was really cool to go back there after my Peace Corps term was over um, and study study these issues in, in a way that really hadn't been studied before. And then, you know, I came back and all my work previously had been international, but I kind of came across this position at Mountain True. How perfect, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, where were you? I mean, where did you go to school? What was oh, your... yeah. I, uh, I was in Knoxville. So okay, number okay. four on the climate list. Is that right? Number four? Number four. Yeah. 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 Um, Is that both undergrad and graduate school? Both, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a Tennessee native, so I bleed orange. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, I came across this position when I was wrapping up my grad school work. And I had, you know, similar story to almost everybody that lives here, had worked here as a camp counselor or gone to camp. You know, we all yeah. kind of have ties to here somehow and knew I really loved the area. Um, so it was pretty cool to have this opportunity open up in a place that I really had strong ties to and strong, meaningful ties to. So I went for it and luckily they hired me. <laughs> yeah. And that was back in 2017? Is, is 2014. 14. So I actually started out as an AmeriCorps okay. um, and did AmeriCorps with Mountain True kind of in a similar role for two years. And then they found funding to hire me full time. So I was smattering of really good luck. <laughs> So, so how long has the state of our river report um, been been happening? Is this kind of a yearly thing that Mountain True puts out? We put it out actually every two years. Every two years. And this, for the French Broad, this is our third iteration of it. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're dating back about six years now, maybe maybe seven, depending on our publishing timelines. So we, we do look at data in kind of a two-year time frame. And for folks who don't know Mountain True and the French Broad River Keeper Program, we take data all all across the watershed for all different types of reasons internally and then we also publish a lot of our data on the swimguide.org um, website and so we took all of our data for yeah. those two years much of it volunteer collected is that right we have an amazing set of volunteers who go out some weekly some monthly to to grab this water qualities or water samples for us and then we'll process them in our, in our in-house lab um, and we're very grateful for them because we could not be in all these places at the same time. <laughs> so how, how many different spots in the... Now, so, now you now just backing up, Mountain True does the French Broad and other watersheds within Western North Carolina. What are the, some of the other watersheds? That yeah, yeah. So we, um, to back up even more, Mountain True kind of has a regional focus. We work right. in the Southern Appalachians. Mountain. Yeah, the mountain <laughs> region. Um, and so we have four river keepers, the French Broad River Keeper, Watauga River Keeper, Broad River Keeper, and then the Green River Keeper. But we also have a really strong watershed program out in Murphy that focuses on the, the Hiawassee. Hiawassee. Yeah. 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 I used to live on the Hiawassee River uh, for eight years in Hiawassee, Georgia. You know, oh, it, in North Car in Georgia, it's the Hiawassee River, and it turns into the Hiawassee River <laughs> when it flows into North Carolina. <laughs> I didn't know you knew that. Well, I wanted to answer your your question, Brad, earlier that, you know, this, this report analyzed 1,167 samples from 90 locations. 90 locations. 90 locations in order to create this report. Just for the French broth. That's just for that the French broth. And then the others, yeah. you're doing the same. Okay. Exactly, yeah. So how are we stacking up? The, how is the French broth stacking up? Well, versus the other. And I want to say, right, there's, there's, yeah. there's two ways of looking at this, the report, which is available online at Mountain True. And, and I think it's worth everybody going and taking a look at this. But there's the 
swimming and recreational, and then there's just the, the health of the stream. And, and, and they're kind of looked at a little bit differently, right? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Bob. So this is a little bit different from how we've done reports in previous years. Previously, we kind of mushed everything together. But this year, we decided to really separate those two things because the goals of those data are, are a little bit different. So the E. coli kind of recreation data is its own kind of set and model. And then the aquatic, like what's good for aquatic organisms and river stream health is its own kind of data set that we um, formatted in a, in a different way. That's not as vulnerable to E. coli in, in, a, in a way that obviously swimming and recreation are to, to, to humans and to, to, to pets, which is, is really just, just fecal matter, right, that's making its way into our water system. Exactly, yeah. So E. coli is a bacteria that we find in, in our, all of our guts, warm mammal or warm blooded mammals. Um, and it's really the best indicator for water quality that would impact public health. So, you know, E. coli might be high in an area, but not all E. coli is bad, actually. Some E. coli doesn't really harm us in a health type way, but it is the best indicator for what else might be in that waterway, viruses or other bacteria that would make uh -huh. us sick. And this is what the EPA recommends for us to, to measure in order to alert the public when and where it's safe to go swimming. So tell us how the French Rot Broad River Basin is doing for swimming and recreational opportunities based on, on your study. Yeah, it, it really depends on the day, to be honest with you. You know, um, days where the water's really clear and it hadn't rained in a long time or in a few days, it, the water quality is, is pretty fine in most places. If we've just had a pretty big rain and the water's super muddy or, or chocolate milk looking, as some people describe yeah. it, it's probably got elevated E. coli, which means it's got some other stuff in there too. And, and you might want to think about going somewhere else or mitigate that by going in a canoe versus going swimming. You know, there's there's ways to mitigate the yeah. risk. Well, I'm looking at the you know at the at the Mountain True website. There's a you know a map of of the region here, and and you show um, the French Broad River, which which kind of flows into Brevard and um, and and works its way down in through by Hendersonville into Asheville, then eventually onto Marshall and Hot Springs, and and we see a lot of red all along there. Um, and and when I read the report, it was particularly when it gets the worst spot is is um, right here at Hominy Creek and the French Broad River, which is just you know just just south of Asheville FM Studios down there. I I, I know that area really all. well. Not far at um, all. But that Hominy Creek, which is coming out of of Canton and Candler, um, is, is a real problem spot for you know for things getting into the river and um, and getting that E. coli count up. What, what are some of the things that, that are affecting the quality of our rivers? Yeah, it, it comes from a multitude of sources. So to begin with, we see high E. coli from, you know, maybe agricultural runoff. If, if there's a cattle farm or something like that and there's a big rain that kind of brings all that stuff in. Um, we also see it when we have kind of weak or leaky septic systems in certain areas yeah. when um, those can definitely leak into surrounding waterways which would end up in the French Broad. Additionally, I want to thank you all for getting into those sewer holes <laughs> and looking around. I see pictures of Hartwell Carlson, who's our French Broad River keeper here, um, doing some of that dirty work. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I believe there was just a um, a leak recently found, right? That yeah. that was kind of not easy to detect. Some of these are really quite hard to find. Um, this the photo you're probably talking about is we found a leak in Shiloh recently, and we we have been looking for this thing for a year now. I mean, some of this... So it's like a detective work, It's very it? detective. It's <laughs> it's a lot of labor hours. It's a lot of walking through creeks and streams and, you know, getting cut up with thorns and poison ivy. <laughs> um, ticks. Ticks, yeah. Ugh. And, uh, yeah, it, it's not an easy... It's not... They, these are not always easy things to find. It takes, yeah. it takes a lot of, of labor. Um, and so we found one recently in the Shiloh neighborhood... And actually, Hartwell's out there this morning with MSD to working on getting it, it fixed. But so. now is that, that's a municipal leak, a, a, 
not in a septic tank, but a leak in the municipal right. water or sewer system. Right. So that's a different situation. Right. Oftentimes, if there's kind of a weak spot in the sewer infrastructure, that the the wastewater can come out of that, out of like a weak joint, or maybe we've had a big rain and that infiltrates the sewer pipes, mm. that stuff can can flow out what of the What do the big mantle. rains push water down into the sewer pipes, right? Or is it is a system that, the sewer system is not a contained system, right? It's It will overflow. It will overflow into with the rivers. It's designed to, right? Well, there's a, there's a, they call it inflow and infiltration. So if we have a big rain event and all the water around our pipes are, is saturated, there can be a little, there can be a infiltration, infiltration sense, of yeah. rainwater into the sewer pipes. And then that just really stresses the system and it has to go somewhere. And so it might result in an overflow of, of a manhole, which will release fecal matter into the waterways as well. So, um, you know, MSD here locally is really good about updating their infrastructure and making sure pipes are of the right capacity in the right places, depending on demand. And they've got a whole strategy with capital improvement program projects. But, you know, sometimes it's a matter of, of sometimes they can't get to a, a site necessarily when we see, you know. So it's it's a matter of dispersing resources in timely manner. So it, 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 what, what's the bigger problem? Is it septic or the, the cattle or, or the municipal systems? How, how do they compare in terms of the magnitude of the problem of what's contributing? I think it, it depends that. on where you are, for sure. One thing we didn't really speak about was stormwater itself, stormwater. When we have a rain and all the water just kind of funnels its way to the nearest creek or stream, it carries whatever is on the road at that time into the waterways. And it is a source of pollution. And Asheville, yeah. city of Asheville specifically, is a, a big participant in stormwater pollution for our waterway. Uh, and we've worked with city staff, created this Asheville Stormwater Task Force that made recommendations to the city on how they can improve um, their stormwater control methods. Yeah. And so we're working with them on, on that. At the Down moment. on Hominy Creek, you see, just kind of before it hits the French Broad River, you see kind of a trap that is designed to catch at least floating material that is moving down. Um, and you'll often see there, you know, after a storm or something, that there's a lot of trash there. But yeah, we have to give a big shout out to Asheville Greenworks. They have several of these, um, tr they call them trash trouts. They capture ah. they capture floating trash in a lot of the waterways and they have them really all over the watershed at this point. But they have to go out there after every rain to go clean those things out and, wow. and get all the trash that ends up uh, collected there. And of course, that's not going to catch anything liquid, you know, that kind of makes its way or into the water. Or biological. It doesn't catch right. anything biological. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. But yeah, they do catch a lot. It's cool to see those. So one of the climate impacts would be increased rainfall, right? I mean, if we have bigger storms, more, I mean, one of the predictions of climate change is that the storms are more frequent or the storms when they happen are bigger, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. more rain, and, and that's a Da danger for our waterways. Right? Exactly. And and that's why we really want to work with the city of Asheville on how they control and manage stormwater because we are going to have more of it in shorter. Yeah, but what, what's some ideas that are on the table for, for managing stormwater? There's a lot we can do. Historically, we've managed stormwater, just get it off the road as fast as possible and just sh um, shoot it to the nearest creek or stream. But in the last several decades, new methodologies have come out. It can be rain gardens, detention ponds, rain barrels. You know, there's a lot of things we can do to help slow down the release of stormwater and filter those pollutants out before they get to the creek. Um, and so we're, we, the task force made a whole list of recommendations and where they should be implemented. So we're trying to push that through um, city staff. Yeah. What's, what's your um, sense of how city staff is, is going to receive these, these requests? I think they're working through it. You know, it's hard. City staff so understaffed a lot of times, also underfunded. And so it's a matter of kind of pulling those two th things up at the same time. <laughs> As a nonprofit, we like to move pretty quickly, and the city is oftentimes not able to move as quickly as we like. So, yeah. it's a you know it's an ongoing discussion. There's a um, another chart that I wanted to make mention here at, at Mountain True. Um, 
website that, that this is this is on stream health and and I, and I noticed that one of the, the more healthier streams a hundred is a perfectly clean stream and um, which one is that the well I didn't name the stream yet oh, but the, the, but a well, hundred is a perfect score so uh, to I speak see. so it, it means that the health is really clean and and the only one that received this um, rating was was Catalucci Creek came up um, that flows right out of Smoky Mountain National Park and so you got clean water but the second runner-up is Bent Creek which is um, which is wonderful to hear that um, you know since you know it's such a special spot for many of us that live here in Asheville it feels like our kind of our, our real neighborhood park here that the Bent Creek stream health is is doing really well which is good to hear yeah. Also, it also looks like, um, you know, and this is something that um, is the Pigeon River seems to be cleaning up pretty well, too. And now with the close of the paper mill, which was a major influencer, right, for the river health, um, that river should only get better and better. Over time, for sure. I mean, it re- those three examples really go to show you that how we manage the land around our waterways affects the quality of that water. So the more open space, the more wooded space we can have um, around our water, the, the cleaner that that water resource is going to be. Yeah. Well, we got to take a short break right here on the Climate Buzz, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Climate Buzz. I'm Dr. Bob, along with Brad Rouse, Kelly Sheehan, out there somewhere in the Netherlands. I saw her post from the Netherlands. Netherlands, and then, garden she was in. and then on the way to Croatia. So, well, joining us today in the studio is Anna Alsobrook, um, who is Mountain True's French Broad Watershed Science and Policy Manager. And we've been talking about their their biannual State of Our Rivers report, um, which, oh my goodness, thank you so much yeah. uh, for doing that for our region. It must have been just a, just a, so much work involved in putting this report together. Yeah, it's quite a bit, a lot of data to cipher through. Yeah. And um, and so um, with that said, Anna, we, we usually end the show with a, with a green tip of the day. And, um, you know, I thought maybe um, you could help our listeners um, kind of with some green tips and taking care of our water. Yeah, absolutely. Number one, thanks for having me and letting me nerd out about our report with y'all. <laughs> uh, some things that we suggest folks to, to do to help climate impacts, especially around water. Planting trees is always a great idea. Um, if you're a homeowner, you can get a rain barrel, help to to help collect um, the rainwater that comes off of your roof. Uh, rain gardens are another great idea to help slow stormwater runoff. Um, come with us on a river cleanup. You can mm. volunteer yeah. with Asheville Greenworks to help clean out their trash trouts. There's a ton of ways to get involved with cleaning up our waterways. If you want to check out our report, it's at mountaintrue.org. We get really into the details there, so feel free to check that out and find your local stream or neighborhood stream. And if you want to make a donation, we are also at mountaintrue.org. Oh, nice. We uh, <laughs> we love a good donation coming in. So, thank, yeah. yeah, thank you all for having me. And feel free to reach out well, to us with questions or, or concerns along the way. Have we got time for one for one question? The um, Sure. What about people who own houses or rent houses who that have septic tanks? I mean, you know, that, that would seem to be a big issue that they're getting old, they're leaky, they're not maintained, and, and they're causing a problem. People may not even know that it's, they're causing a problem. That's a, that's a great question, Brad. So I, I didn't get a chance to mention this. We are actively running a program for folks who do have septic tank issues. If they cannot afford to get it fixed or uh-huh. upgraded, we have a pot of money that they can apply to, um, to to give them in order to get it fixed and updated so that it's not leaky anymore. We were able to to get a, a big pot of money from the state general assembly last year and so we are granting it out to homeowners and individuals who can't afford to to fix their septic systems. but and, and even if you can afford it of course people don't want to spend money on something that you know i mean the, my wife accuses me of always deferring maintenance so 
<laughs> on my house. But what are some? Are there some telltale signs of what they should be looking for? Or I mean, is there something that's cl- obviously you have a problem? If you- once you start seeing it in your house, <laughs> you know it's a problem. <laughs> um, also, you you might be able to see uh, maybe like a, a much greener section of yard. Um, or sometimes people have noticed gurgling up in their yard. That or kind if you of can thing. smell it. Or if you can smell it, for sure. Um, so okay. those are kind of like pretty significant signs. We do recommend folks to look at septic systems about every five years, get it inspected and, and pumped. And, we and do, who, ins- who does that? A lot of private companies. Uh, okay, so like it would be a septic tank company and call them and come inspect my, make sure I'm not doing, you know, yeah, yeah, that yeah. sounds great. And if y'all have questions, all we have a whole thing on our webpage about the septic program as well, too. Well, awesome. Anna, thank you so much for joining us today on the Climate Buzz, and we hope you come back again and keep us updated on how our yeah, water's doing. Hear. Yeah, thank y'all for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Great. I got a chance to see the wolf pups all over right. this past week. Um, the the nine, or I think there's eight at the, at the WC Nature Center, the endangered right. red wolf. Um, Mom and dad over there had their first litter of pups, and they're about five weeks old. And um, when I first got there, it was all quiet, and Mama was resting over in the corner. And then um, I kind of went on and visited the red panda and um, the gray wolf, and I came back, and they were out and running around. And um, it was quite something. I posted it on the Climate Buzz feed. So if you want to see some video of the red wolf pup, go on over to the Climate Buzz on Facebook and Instagram and Why don't you like us and follow us, right? That's a good idea. Thanks for listening to the Climate Buzz Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please share with your friends and find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, where we promise to keep you up to date with all the climate buzz. We want to acknowledge and thank Asheville FM volunteer Mike Engel for his time and effort in producing and uploading the Climate Buzz podcast every week that allows us to reach more people who are concerned about the unfolding climate crisis. We invite you to check out Asheville FM's website, www.ashevillefm.org, where you can listen live, check out the Climate Buzz page with archives of our latest shows, as well as have access to all the Asheville FM radio programs that inspire our listeners to build connections across communities and to discover new music and ideas.